as a still photographer because right, right. I was bouncing back between stills and, and uh, motion picture. Right. And at some point, I realized that I put my cameras away mm. and joined the demonstration. Mm -hmm. And that was a major turning point for me because, mm. you know, as a journalist, you're supposed to be outside mm -hmm. photographing what was going on. And I understood there's a line where you stop being a spectator and you join mm -hmm. in with folks. So right. I went in when they took over the black group, took over Hamilton Hall, I mm -hmm. think it is. Mm -hmm. And I did stills then, then came back and did video because I was working with Third World News mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. time. So that's pretty much how I got involved. As Adit uh, uh, said earlier, I was the only black cameraman with mm -hmm. Third World News mm -hmm. And I don't know if everybody kind of realized it, but how this film was about the gymnasium that they were going to build in the black community and how the white students and the filmmakers co-opted that whole thing. And it became about white students and their demands. Mm. So I say that to say that it was important for me to be a member of Third World Newsreel mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because at least I dealt with the black folks that were dealing with this. And they, actually, it was the leadership. You remember, they told the white guys to leave because mm -hmm. <laughs> you guys are not organized enough. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And at the time, the Panther Party was pretty organized and had a good system here in Harlem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And, um, like, what are you, I mean, you've probably seen it a few times, right, in the last, because there's been a few... So this is the second time second I've time? seen it since the film was made. Wow, since 68. Since 68, <laughs> since 68 wow. yes. So what, just, what are your impressions, like, 50 years later? Like, what are your thoughts? Uh, like I said, I'm disturbed. Yeah. I'm disturbed that black issues always get pushed under. Mm -hmm. and, I, and again, I'm not saying that the issues that the white students were talking about were not important. Mm -hmm. But the issue of what was happening to our community got lost in the sauce. Mm -hmm. You understand? And I think that's a problem about all the stuff that was happening. Heard about the board of directors at Columbia. And that's important to talk about. It was important to add that information. But unfortunately, we get lost in the bigger picture. You know, because Columbia is still taking over the community and the black community. And now that they need more student housing, mm -hmm. <laughs> and City College is doing the same thing, guys. Yeah, and let me just say that I worked up here for 40 years. So I was in the art department, photography department. Mm -hmm. So I saw that they were doing the same kind of thing, pushing people out, pushing the community, what was the community out, and moving in students. Right, right. But, I mean, at the same time, it's small. There was, the gym wasn't built. Do you, I, and I, my question for you is how much do you think the documentation of what was happening how much do you think your efforts as a documentarian affected that? How much do you think this impacted Mine's it? Mine's as still... an individual, no, it's a group effort. Right, but the film itself. Yeah, the film itself, do like I think... said, yeah. I didn't see, this is the second time right. I saw it. Uh, I think it's an important film. Anytime you talk about what's going on in the community and the wrongs that are being done by major private institutions, mm -hmm. I think it's important to air that. That's, mm -hmm. that's important. Of course, the, the um, gym wasn't built, but there was a lot of action out of the black community that you don't see in this film. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sure. So this, like I said, the, the, the real issue was co-opted, mm -hmm. right? So blacks had a fight, you know, without as much press as this gave them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, so that's what my issue was. Of course, mm -hmm. the film was good. Anytime you make something, anytime you talk about an ill, something wrong in society, it helps. It gives exposure. Sure. So, and that level, and it yes, that. and yeah. it's important, but yeah. we still have to realize, yeah, okay, that was good, but what about us? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's why I feel, because I'm looking and I'm saying, wow, well, the little bit of footage that I shot, I know I stayed in there where the black students were, I stayed in there where the black organizations were, and I see a lot of that wasn't even used. Mm. You understand? And I think it's important for me being the only black cameraman, the only black person in third world news mm. for a lot of years. Mm. Uh, and I was because of my political outlet and because that there was a 
tall, lanky Jewish guy named Alan Siegel. There was a school on 14th Street called the Free University. I don't know if any older folks have ever heard of it. Thank you. It was run by the Communist Party. And I went to see a film presentation of art films by Andy Warhol, Jonas Meeker, and the like. Mm -hmm. I was so annoyed at what they were doing calling film mm -hmm. that I looked for a film course. Found the Free University, took this class with this guy named Alan Siegel. I knew cameras, so he would give me a camera, go shoot, photograph my community. We became tight buddies. Mm -hmm. That's how I became, and how I stayed with Third World News Real for such a long time, because him and I pretty much worked together. Mm -hmm. He was the one who got me, so I wound up going to Cuba. So I was one of the guys that went to Cuba in 1968 to shoot the film that they did on the Isle of Pines. Mm. All right. Got blacklisted. Now, politically naive on some level, but here I am on the list. I mean, I was blacklisted. I had to go to Guyana. I had to come back from Cuba, stay in New York for almost a year, couldn't get to work, had to get on welfare. I left working for Black Journal. Mm. And a, a lot of freelance, I'm making a lot of, I'm making a decent sum of money. I was making $125 a day working for Jack Black Durham. Mm. 1967. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I said, hey, listen, so I get the opportunity to go to Cuba. Alan says, hey, I want you to go. I went, we stayed three months. We were only supposed to be down there like three weeks. We stayed three months because of all kinds of travel difficulties. We got the film finished, came back to New York and couldn't get a job, nobody would touch me. Mm. You understand? So I had to leave New York and go to Guyana mm -hmm. to get a job so I could work, and then after coming back from Guyana, I finally, whatever. What did you do in Guyana? I uh, um, worked with the government shooting film, uh, mm. teaching, mm -hmm. photography. Mm. All right. uh, again, it was a lot of expatriates in Guyana. Mm. This is 19, 1960. 1969, 1970, 1971, around mm -hmm. in that time. So a lot of people who had left Ghana, a lot of black artists who had left Ghana wound up going to Guyana. Mm -hmm. So it was a good place to be, mm -hmm. right? Came back and continue. I'm still working with Alan Siegel now. He's doing a film on Malcolm. Mm -hmm. So it's been a lifelong relationship. I realized the importance of Third World News Real. And that's why I stayed with them for mm -hmm. such a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I started out as a, a still photographer. I'm part of a group called Kamonge. It's an African word. And we've been a group starting in Harlem for the last 52 years. All right. So that was why it was easy for me to make the change from still photography to filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And strangely enough, now I'm back into filmmaking, which I never thought I would. And for all you guys that, with all these little teeny cameras that are excellent, 1080p, I mean, I was blown, blown away. I never thought to do film again until I got these little $300, $400 cameras that could do some of the most incredible video that I've actually seen. And for all you students that can't, you know, when they talk about you know, big red cameras and all these other fancy cameras, you can get a camera for 400 bucks to do Great video. Mm -hmm. So I'm now doing, I consider myself now a cultural anthropologist. So I, and I primarily try to shoot black culture, not exclusively, but as much as I can. Mm -hmm. And you said that you're also working on a, a Malcolm X project yeah. now? Yes. Yeah, what, what are you doing? I'm, doing? I've done some video here. Mm -hmm. I've done, Interviews? I went into my archive. No, no, pretty much this uh, background information. Uh, is this trying a to set up, yeah. Uh -huh. setting, setting kind of a background for uh, Malcolm, where he was, shot the old temple. Uh -huh. uh, I have a lot of political um, stuff in my archives that sure. I've, you know, demonstration stuff. Uh -huh. Trying to set a, a, an environment for where mm -hmm. Malcolm was doing his, his deal at. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's pretty much what I'm doing. And the collective that you mentioned is still active? Of course, yes. Yeah, so what's going on with, with the collective? Can you talk a little bit about that? What's well, we're going to, we're... In talking with the Museum of the City of New York to do uh, an exhibition there. Nice. I don't know how many people know, but we just had a major boofing exhibition at APAD. Anybody ever heard of APAD? 
APAD is like, uh, what do they do? What is the thing that they do in Miami? The big uh, thing from Sweden, Denmark. It's a big arts. Uh, oh, the, art thing Basel. the thing in December. Yeah, yeah Art yeah, Basel. Yeah, Basel yeah. So art, APAD is like a New York City version of Art Basel. Okay. But it's primarily photography, not anything else. Photography and books. Uh -huh. So we just did that. Uh, we're going to do a major exhibition at the Virginia Museum of Fine Art in mm -hmm. 2020, uh, 2020, and once it leaves there, it's coming up to New York and to the Whitney. Mm. So. And this includes documentation of Harlem over the this last is doing, 50 This is going to include documentation of uh, over the last 50 years. Last 50 years. And they're featuring wow. a series, there were a series of books called The Black Photographer's Annual. Did anybody ever see one? Go to Virginia Fine Arts Museum and just type in Virginia Fine Arts Museum Black Photographer's Annual. Mm -hmm. They digitize all three volumes uh -huh. and they're pretty much all the photograph all the photographs are done by black photographers. And they did a really good job of uh, yeah. I mean the quality is really good and it was just good to see those three and I think it's actually four versions of it. Mm -hmm. So they and one of the founders of the group that I'm a uh, founding member of he uh, was born and lived in Virginia, so that's why they kind of contacted us and said that's why we got. This would be quite an archive. Yeah. There's a film that I worked on on a gentleman named Herman Ferguson. Does anybody remember the name? Okay. Herman Ferguson, we did a film on Sonny Carson, so those are the things that I exclusively huh. did camera work on. We uh -huh. did an interview with Ferguson before he went to Guyana, huh. and we did a film on uh, um, Sonny Carson. So there's a lot of material that Third World has. But like I said, I just moved on to, you know, it was from one place to the next, just pretty much doing, uh, went back to still photography. There are two people I saw in there that are major political activists now, right? And like I said, one, um, one person was the, uh, the uh, founding member of the Harlem Black Panther Party, and it was another brother who worked with the New York, uh, the Black Arts Organization. So they're, you know, pretty much still doing their political stuff and leadership, and teaching at universities now, too. Has anybody here worked in journalism? Okay. One of the deals you do, when you shoot it, you turn it over to somebody, and you're off to the next project. Like I say, those films that I just mentioned, uh, Sonny Carson, her, I've never seen them. I know they exist, or did exist, because I shot them. But you turn stuff over, and I, I, uh, I had to call for some pictures of Malcolm X, and still pictures. And I said, oh, yeah, I got a bunch. And I went looking through my negatives, and I realized I was working for an organization, Liberator Magazine. I don't know how many people mm -hmm. remember, but I was working with Liberator Magazine, and I turned the photographs yeah. over. So never got the negatives back. Yeah. Right? So for all you guys that tend to do this, please get track of your digital files, whatever it is you give to somebody. Try to keep up with them. Because 20 years from now, you might need them. And like I said, unfortunately, um, and you'll find this, if you, anybody who works in any job, if you do your job, you turn the work over to somebody else, and that's the end of your control over it. It's off to somebody else. And like I said, looking at this, I'm really surprised how little footage they use of mine. But yeah, but I mean, but it's the nature of the beast. It always happens. It's still happening now. There's still issues in Harlem that don't even get to film. Instead, <laughs> unfortunately, and Columbia is still doing the same thing they did back then. Yeah, not not so much on Columbia, but on the same period. There's a there's a movie that was shown earlier in the series at the Museum of New York. Um, no Vietnamese ever called me nigger. That's you know really about the anti-war movement in Harlem. No Vietnamese ever called me nigger. What you might want to and that's that's one to maybe think about looking at. And also to answer your other question, there were. I looked it up, there were 125 black students at Columbia at the time. Okay. What you might want to look for, look on YouTube and look for uh, Black Panther Party in Harlem, whatever organization yeah. in Harlem. What was the other group? The Young Lords. Yeah, the Young Lords. You might, because yeah. I've, seen, I've seen documentaries on both of these groups. 
The Young Lords, and, and for you guys that don't know, the Young Lords was sort of the counterpart of the Latin part of the Black Panther Party. And between those two groups, they did a lot of organizing in the community. They, fed, they set up food programs. So these food programs that are now instituted in school, Black Panther Party and the Young Lords set these yeah, programs up. Yeah, that's where it started. Up. The free breakfast program literally yeah. started by... You know what I'm saying? So yeah. those are the places that you might want to, because let me just say this. I, I found that I've worked in the industry for over 50 years, and I found that there are more black films that were made than there were people who were producers and people who got them out there to the public. So there are just tons and tons and tons of black material out there, but you just got to find it. That much I do know. I've seen it myself. Uh, and for people who are not aware of it, you look at this thing that they're doing on PBS on Reconstruction. Uh, it's an important series for any, it's hard to look at, but uh, I think it's really important to see because of especially young folks that don't know what happened in the South. I happened to have worked in the South in the 60s. So I kind of knew that and then because of my young age, I remember pick, I picked cotton and rode on the back of buses. Uh, I was born and raised in the city, but they sent me south for the summer. And I, after picking cotton, I told them there was no way that I, I actually performed. They could never send me back south again. But I think it's important to find out what happened at those periods so you'll find out what the evolution is, that what's happening now is the same thing happened 30, 40, 50 years ago. There's a great Young Lords movie that was also shown in the series. It's also Third World Newsreel, if you want to just share that title. That Yeah, and, and she was a lead organizer in this movement and organized, co-organized a garbage strike at 16, growing up in East Harlem. All these films and some other films that are, some have actually are made by black filmmakers, including Madeline Anderson, who was here uh, a few weeks ago in the series. All of these films are at measles.org and are part of this series, Made in Harlem, under series, Made in Harlem, Class of 68. They're like, and you know, incredible list of films that we've been showing in the series that speak to the themes that you're interested in, films made by black makers, films dealing with Harlem, dealing with this history, anti-war movement, the Panthers, Malcolm X, all of the stuff that we've been talking about. So there is you know, amazing stuff out there and there are these incredible makers and pioneers like who we have here today that are like on the vanguard that broke the mold that were doing this shit before anybody else was and have influenced the makers today, right, that are prominent, the Ava DuVernay's, everybody would not exist without people that did what they did 50 years ago. So um, we are so lucky to have you here. Yeah. And you know, thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for being on the vanguard. Thank you for being a pioneer and not taking no for an answer, you know, huh? and <laughs> influencing all of us. Um, and yes, our problems are still here, but we're gonna keep fighting. And this helps us understand, we need to understand where we've been to understand where we're going. I, like I say, we were doing something called guerrilla filmmaking. We had these old Bell and Howell, you know, have seen those old eight millimeter Bell and Howell, brown wind up cameras, that was what most of us used. We shot the footage, sometimes if we were at a real demonstration, somebody would either come pick up the footage so we wouldn't get busted and have the footage on us. So once it left our hands, we don't know what happened. I remember Alan, sat me down and wanted to teach me how to do editing. I didn't have a clue. And I understood that I was going to stick with what I knew. So I passed up that opportunity. It wasn't me, but it was all turned over. And there were rotating people who came in. And there were people who were different concepts. And there, of course, like everything else, there was a lot of turmoil about how this was going to get cut and how this was going to be done. But I think it was about, it was always a rush to get the footage out. So that's why we called it guerrilla. It wasn't, it was down and dirty. You know, it was like war correspondents that developed their films in toilets and stuff like that. I mean, seriously, it was raw, right? So whoever had the ability to do it, did it.
There were a lot of issues because the newsreel was really attached to SDS and all these different white organizations. So there was always a battle to give black communities, black issues, the forefront to give them a play. And like I said, for me, for me working with Alan Siegel, uh, I don't know how well you got to know Alan, but working with him, he understood issues and he would even say, hey, we're going, you know, I've set up something, we're going to photograph this brother, we're going to photograph that brother. And he understood what was important for Third World Newsreel to be doing and to try to, to, to give an even picture about the struggle that was going on in these years instead of just giving the white point of view. Uh, with, because I went down, when I went to Cuba, I went down with some of the crew from Third World News, where a couple of them were from SDS. And they really told the Cubans that there was major struggles and we, had, we were armed. And we, you know, they just told the Cubans some really off the wall kind of stuff. You know, and I mean, fortunately, I was there to just say, hey, wait a minute, y'all got to stop that, because that's, <laughs> that's not happening. You understand? Because at some point, they, they kind of said, because you guys are armed and stuff, they took us to the, the rifle range every day. I'm saying, hey, man, I, I never had handled a gun. So this thing that they're telling us, we need to be, obviously, the Panthers were. But I'm from New York, and we hadn't got to that point yet. Right, and it began because of the laws in, in, in California and those places like that, it was legal to carry arms. So there was a whole different headset. So there were always issues with me being the only one. But like I said, I found the kindred spirit in Allen, and I think the two of us would pretty much did a lot of good hammer work for Third World. The, the, like the, the um, evolution from newsreel to third world newsreel. If you could ah. speak a little bit about that. I mean, you or Jason, you could probably. I have not a clue. Yeah. <laughs> no, seriously, you know, and it's really important. And I think I really wanted to kind of make this clear about what, when you're in the industry, everything is kind of broken down. So there was times that I never got to the office. I, you know, I was always with Alan. That was my part of where, you know, hey, we work together, so I, Newsreel was this other thing over there. The There's, yeah, their office over there somewhere, and we didn't want to deal with them because we didn't want to have to battle with them about black issues, hmm. right? Because you got to remember that most of them were middle-class white kids. Yes, I was. My Jenny saw it. <laughs> I was, I just, yeah, she, yeah. Yeah, but I, I really don't know, uh, JT would have to tell you, but at the beginning, it was a free-form group. There, and what I mean by guerrilla, that even if you just knew how to handle the camera, they weren't, I was like the only kind of semi-professional person that came into the group. But anybody that, if you could hold the camera, still take it, if you wanted to take pictures, yeah, take this camera. That was how loosely formed we were. We were, in a situation that you had to be willing to get your head cracked because if you had a camera, the cops gonna zero in on you, right? So you had to make that choice. There wasn't a lot of people who wanted to make that choice and because I was black, I was definitely kind of sent it out but fortunately, I got through it unscathed, mm -hmm. right? But the amount of films that Third World Newsreel did, Newsreel to Third World Newsreel did, is unimaginable. I know, I, I, while I was with them, I know we might have worked on 30, 40 short films. Mm. Yes? Did you work on the community control film, the Brownsville uh, student uh, school? Yes. School? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and again, because I worked with newspapers, so if I wasn't doing film, I was doing stills. Because uh, I, worked I worked as a journalist for with, uh, several different organizations and newspapers and the like. You know, when I got into Newsreel, I had been a still photographer with some recognition for about six or seven years. So that was how I fitted in and and kind of got taken in quickly because I knew how to operate a camera. I knew f-stops, I knew shutter speeds. I knew this kind of stuff that a lot of the members didn't know. They were novice at it. Okay, I can, I'll try, I'll learn. It was learn, learn on the job kind of thing. 
So there was a lot of footage that I imagine was unusual too. Well, I just, I feel that students are not as politicized as we were back in the 60s. There was a lot more information going on. There was a lot more publications. There were a lot more community publications. There was a lot more documentation of what the issues were. You guys don't get that. So you get it through news, your cell phones, and all this other kind of stuff filtered, right? So, you know, I couldn't tell you one particular place, but if there's an activist organization on campus, because that's where you should start to work at. If there's some organization, you need to find out the organizations on campus and find out what they're doing, right? That's where you start. That's, I think that would be your base. Right, and find out the ones that, you know, not the social ones, but hey, are you doing something? Find out about the people who are still left over. You gotta remember, you guys had several strikes here at this school. There were several things taken over here at City College. So, and I, from what I remember at the time, they were the Dominican groups that led that, if I'm not mistaken, because I met a bunch of the leadership at that time. And they kind of understood issues. So. It doesn't matter who the leadership is, as long as they're talking about the issues at hand. And the issues at hand is the communities that the schools are in. And that we, are, what are we gonna do, how are we gonna displace people who have lived here, people who have reasonable rents, you know, cause we're gonna get displaced them, and then they're not gonna have any place to go. Right, Columbia took a whole, a, a whole block over down on, whatever happened to that, that block that, huh? Okay, at one point they bought 114th Street, 114th Street between Adam Clayton and 8th Avenue, they bought the whole block. Empty, put everybody out, it was supposed to recondition and it was supposed to be for student housing. Somehow or another, the city and some couple of black politicians kind of caught a wind of it and crashed that plan. So we still don't know what's happening with the buildings. There. They're still not fully rented, are they? Okay, so, but this has been 10 years, 20 years that they emptied the block out. So what I'm saying is that I think it's important for you to find out what's happening on campus. Find out what's happening in your community. You guys are always on these social networks. I mean, there's stuff out there, guys. I mean, it really is. Uh, here's the deal. I remember part of my education was a radio station called WBAI. How many people? Now, it's different from it was than it was in the 60s, but I found out all the, what was going on, where I wanted to go to shoot. It's still on. There's still a lot Find, of Yeah, find it. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be better than the news. I listen to NYC. These are radio stations that I listen to that at least give you correct news and tell you some of the issues and organizations and places where things are going to be happening that you might want to go to to hear what somebody's saying to find out how to get involved. We're going to take a couple more questions. I just wanted to mention also We Act. I don't know if you're familiar with them. That's a, a really amazing group that does work around environmentalism, gentrification. What's great is that it's like Harlem members. And I would just say that's the other piece, right? Is like, we have to build coalitions. And it's really hard, but really also look at how you can work with like groups in Harlem, organizations in Harlem, community members that are doing this work and build those bridges. That's part of the problem, is that y'all as students are so sequestered and separate from community members that are fighting these battles in Harlem. And we need to figure out how to work together and build those coalitions. And I think that's like where a lot of the hard work that needs to happen that'll open this up more. Um, and it's a great opportunity also to just like learn about organizing and right, become a better organizer. So just wanted to suggest that. There's a lot of, you know, Harlem <coughs> has an incredible history of political activism and engagement. I mean, just amazing. And you know, to this day, there's so much happening that, you know, it's hard, but like, it's important to figure out how to tap into that stuff. Yeah. One of the things you have to do is you've got to be able to hang in there. You've got to hang. It's like I said, I stuck with Third World. There was battles and disagreements, but I understood it was better for me to be there than not to be there. 
And that's the important part of it, that, that if it's just one voice, it's better to have one voice than no voice at all. I think that's one of the reasons why there was so much information out, because it was happening all over the country. I mean, I, I'm sort of a collector, and I, I remember all the little newsletters and magazines, and somebody was on the street corner passing out this, telling you about where rallies were. They even had poets going up and down the streets in Harlem, you know, reading poetry about demonstrations and strikes and stuff like that. So I found that is one of the major issues about what they learned how to, to deconstruct that. And they now, so if you don't get the information, you don't know where to go, you don't know where to start, you're scratching your head trying to figure out, well, I want to do something. How do I start to do something? And I think it's a, it's a plan. It's the way that we keep you inactive and then we give you a cell phone. We know what to do with you, you know. Who? Pardon me. Oh, of Roy, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think the woman ever gets any sleep. Yeah. No, she's 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 really cool. Yeah. Yeah. You want to know what's going on Yeah, she has a newsletter she sends out too about what's going on and where she's gonna be at. So you could just uh, email her office and try to get on the mailing list. Yeah, and also just continue to figure out ways to harness these tools that you guys understand better than I do, somebody who's a little bit older, and then maybe people who are a lot older do. And remember the line from the film, just like five people, it was in a mimeograph? You know, you have these incredible tools now, and yeah, they can be used against us, but they're also really powerful. And there are <laughs> incredible youth movements that are happening all over the world that are using social media. And I think actually, I would push back a little bit on where you're coming from. I think what's happening now is in some ways akin to what was happening 50 years ago. Yeah. In the same way that mass media was garnered in the 60s, I think we're in a similar period now and we just need to keep doing that, just my opinion. Uh, I'll tell you a little quick story. I was down in New Orleans and I don't know if, how many people heard that once uh, the flood happened and everything happened, they talked about the cops disappearing and the fire department disappearing and they couldn't figure out where they went to. Well, what I found out when I was down there, that these were the second, third generation people who lived in the town, and they refused to live in the old railroad houses that their parents lived in and their grandparents lived in. So they would bought into the new co-ops. Hey, I want something brand new and shiny. But they were all on the ground. Mm -hmm. If you go to New Orleans, most houses are elevated anywhere from six feet to 10 feet. All their houses were on the ground, so that's why they disappeared, because they went to save their families, to save whatever they could, because they bought into this new shiny. So uh, that's my little answer to new shiny. <laughs> okay, other questions? Anybody else? Going once, going twice. Anything you want to say in closing? Any closing comments? No, I just think for young folks here, man, uh, it's always going to be a struggle, but I mean, it's better to struggle than just to lay back and watch your life get flittered away and have somebody continue to tell you what you're supposed to be listening to and doing. Good point. Uh, you know, um, I was fortunate that I was, uh, I was a rebel. I, I kind of didn't listen to folks. And let me just say this, because this is a, an important issue, that I found myself in a lot of situations where I was the only black. So don't get hung up in being the only white, okay? So I'm saying that, but I found in that group, the reason why I was able to hang, because I found a kindred spirit in that group. I found somebody I could work with. I found somebody that really understood, and it wasn't that everybody else didn't understand, but there were people that you could work with and organize better, better with than a bunch of some of the other people. So, I think that's really important because I see a lot of really kind of lethargy in the fact that you guys don't know history. It drives me crazy. I have two interns working in my studio, and I'll try to have some conversation with them, and I'll mention something, and they'll look at me like, I'm just saying, wait a minute, you know, that this is part of your history. You know, they said, if you don't know your history, you're bound to repeat it. 
So I'm telling you, and let me just say, you know, I don't get any money from PBS, and I got a lot of problems, particularly 13. I got a lot of problems with them and their racist point of view about stuff. But when they do do black programming, they do excellent black programming. I think it's important to look at uh, Channel 13. They have a Jersey. Jersey acts like they're black people in the arts. New York acts like there are no black people in the arts. I looked at PBS, I'm a regular watcher of that, and I could see their arts programs, and they could go six months without showing a black artist. New Jersey, it's always there. So they have a New Jersey program, a Long Island, and New York. But I found their programming about black issues is really extremely important. Listening to BBI, BBI, um, what is it? BAI, that you really got to stay in tune, you got to play plugged into this stuff, so you can find out what's going on that you can choose what you want to be involved with. And what goes along with your nature? That's another thing. I did things that, like I said, when somebody wanted me to edit, I don't know how to edit. I don't know. I'm a cameraman. I know that. I know it well. Let me do what I know well. Okay? Mm, thank you. Thanks All so right. much, Sean. Okay.